Well, hey, good morning, church family. It's good to have you guys with us this morning. It is Tuesday morning. Glad that uh, we get to jump into the scripture here today. Um, so I'm going to get right to it this morning um, just because of some time crunch things. Uh, but, uh, <coughs> excuse me, certainly want to dive in to understanding this text. Actually, there's a lot to look at today. Um, we have finally made it to uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, we looked yesterday just briefly at Pilate's uh, discussion with Peter, or I mean with Jesus, Pilate, uh, the governor there in Israel, uh, overseeing that area from a Roman perspective. And, and so we see Jesus uh, on trial. Uh, eventually he's going to be handed over to be flogged and then to be crucified. Um, this would be the most horrific type deaths uh, that we could think of. Um, the, and I've said this before, but our, our very word excruciating, we use that word to describe immense pain or really hard suffering. That word excruciating uh, has its roots in this word, which means out of the cross. That's what the root of excruciating means. It means out of the cross, meaning this was the word that was birthed out of the agony and the misery of what crucifixion would have been. And so we see with Jesus, there was more than just the crucifixion. For Jesus, there was all of this, uh, all of this tension and stress that led up to it, right? We, we talked about on Thursday night, Jesus tells the disciples he's going to be betrayed. He's in the garden praying to the Father, and he's praying, and the Bible tells us that he uh, Luke says he sweat drops of blood. Uh, we, we talked about how that was a, a medical condition. Uh, people under a lot of stress, their capillaries just under their skin uh, can burst, uh, commingling blood with sweat, and it comes out of our pores. And So we looked at that. Um, so there's all that stress. Then, then while he's on trial, he's being beaten while he's on trial. It says that people could walk by and spit on him, walk by and punch him and slap him, things of that nature. Um, Isaiah's uh, book in Old Testament prophesied that they would uh, pull on his beard and things of that nature. So there's always these horrible things. Um, actually, Isaiah's uh, text in uh, about 700 or 600 BC um, tells us, foretelling what was going to take place, that he would be beaten beyond human recognition, meaning you would not recognize who he was because of how beaten he was. Um, and so Pilate hands Jesus over to be flogged. The Bible tells us in chapter 27, verse 27, it says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. Then they put a staff in his right hand, and they knelt in front of him, and they mocked him, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him, they, they spit on him, and they took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they had made a mock, they had mocked him, they took off his robe, put his own clothes on him, then led him away to crucify him. Uh, going back one verse before that, in verse 26, says, Pilate released Barabbas, but had Jesus flogged. That, that thing about being flogged was something that normally didn't happen always at crucifixion. Sometimes it did, but not always. Uh, but for Jesus, it did. Um, Jesus was flogged. Now, it's hard for us to even comprehend the idea of flogging. Um, uh, you know, in, in our, I don't know, our domesticated world that we live in today, we, we think of flogging sometimes as being whipped. And when we think of a whip, we think of like something that cracks or leaves welts and stripes on someone's back or wherever they're hit, uh, things of that nature. Uh, but flogging was much more worse than that. They would have had um, a whip that would have been laced with uh, pieces of bone, uh, maybe even pieces of metal, uh, pieces of stone or lead, uh, lead balls in them, um, all on these fingers that would uh, come off the end of the whip that would be made out of leather, and they had these little ribbons that would go out and have tips of metal and things of that nature. And what they would typically do with a person would be they would take that person who was being flogged and they would either stretch their arms out uh, in this fashion or in many cases they would have an upright pole that was large, so kind of think telephone pole, 
and they would strap their arms around this telephone pole or this pole and tie their hands on the other side so it would um, so it would stretch the skin of the back. And that's kind of what their goal was, was to make the skin on the back taunt um, so it would tear easier. They would strip that person of their clothes and they would begin to whip that person many times. It would be one soldier on this side, one on the other, and they would take turns checkerboarding that person's back. Um, we know historically that they would take those whips and they would whip from the back of the shoulders all the way down uh, across your rear end and all the way down to the back of your legs. That was typically how flogging would take place. And so you can imagine this whip that has metal and bone just raking across your back and across your backside. Um, many people, uh, many people died. There's statistics out there how many people died, but a large number of people died because of the flogging, because of blood loss, um, because uh, organs often were exposed. Um, because of this, it was a horrible, horrible thing. People were often blinded because of this, because as they whipped across the back, things with the the uh, pieces of metal and ribbons of leather would come around and hit people in the eyes and in the face. And it was just a, a, a terrible thing. Jesus endured this, all right? We know Jesus endured this. Um, at the end of that, they would have then asked Jesus to stand and they would have still been mocking him and they would have asked Jesus to then carry the cross. The Bible tells us in verse 32, um, as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon and they forced him to carry the cross. Evidently, Jesus was not strong enough to do this. Um, other gospel writers tell us that Jesus had to carry that cross <coughs> at least part of the way. If you've ever watched the movie, The Passion, you see that portrayed. Uh, most people believe, historians believe, that Jesus would have uh, had to carry the horizontal piece of the cross. Uh, there are many people that believe that the vertical piece of the cross is always positioned at the scene of the cross, the crucifixion, and they would just carry the, the horizontal piece. Either way, it would have been horrible to, for Jesus to do this. So Jesus carries this to the cross. He finally gets there, and then they nail Jesus' feet and his hands to the cross. They would have laid him down on this cross or held him up on this cross and they would have nailed him to that. Um, historically, we see that it says that he was nailed through his hands. Most likely he was nailed through his wrist. Um, that, is, uh, that is traditionally the thought that Jesus had that happen. If you nail through the hand, uh, it's not enough flesh there to hold a body on the cross. But if you, if you hold or nail through the wrist right there, you get two bones. You go between the radius and the ulna, and you can uh, drive a spike through that. He would have uh, had these spikes driven through him. It wouldn't have been like regular nails. It would have been more similar to like a railroad spike that would have been driven through his wrist and then driven through his feet. Uh, how they nailed his feet to the cross, there's speculation on that as well. Some people have it where it's kind of the traditional view that one foot is on top of the other and it's nailed kind of through the fleshly part of his foot. Um, uh, years ago, there were uh, there was an ossuary. An ossuary is a bone box um, holding the remains of someone who had died. Uh, this person's name on the outside of the box, his name was Johannan. Um, uh, Johannan. And um, it was found uh, just north of Jerusalem, I believe. Uh, dating back to the first century, and this person had uh, spikes driven through the heel bone of the person from the outside toward the inner part, uh, indicating that could have been that Jesus' feet were split uh, and put on either side of the cross and driven into the cross that way from the outside through the heel bone. We don't know exactly. There's no way for us to know. What we do know it was, a, it was that it was horrible. I mean, the things that Jesus encountered was absolutely horrible. Um, it's interesting that Jesus, when he was offered, because it tells us about Jesus being offered a drink on the cross that was um, uh, mixed, uh, a mixed drink. It was intended to dull the pain. Jesus refused that drink. Uh, the, the one that was mixed, uh, he refused to drink because I believe he wanted to suffer the full measure of what was needed. He didn't want to... He didn't want to uh, minimize that. Um, 
And so we think about this horrible pain that Jesus had. I mean, the crown of thorns on his head, the beating he endured, um, the physical pain of the cross is just, I mean, we can't even, fa I can't even fathom that. I can't even imagine what that would have been like to experience what Jesus did that day. Um, the Bible tells us that eventually he gave up his spirit and he cried out in a loud voice, uh, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, right? This idea, right, he gave up his spirit. Um, and so we think about this physical beating that Jesus endured, the physical torture that he encountered for us, speaks to the magnitude of love that he had. Uh, the only reason Jesus went to the cross was because of you and I. That's it. I mean, there are no other reasons other than the fact that you and I sinned. And because of our sin, Jesus had to pay the penalty for our sin. He had to suffer death for us. Now tomorrow, we're going to look at the spiritual side of this. We're going to look at the emotional, spiritual pain that Jesus encountered. The physical part is one thing. The physical part is horrible, right? And we can somewhat, we can somewhat empathize with Jesus in that. Not that we've ever experienced anything like that, but we can imagine the immensity of pain that that would have been, right? We, we've been hurt ourselves physically. We know what pain, physical, physical pain feels like. So it's, we could understand to some degree what that have, would have been like for Jesus. The one thing that I think we cannot fully grasp is the spiritual side of this, the, the turmoil, the agony that Jesus experienced on the cross. Um, and so we'll talk about that tomorrow. So when I read Matthew's record of this, or even Mark's, Luke's, John's record of the crucifixion of Jesus, um, I just, it's so hard to even imagine what that would have been like for Jesus. But then you gotta think about the Father as well. That the Father sat in glory, sat in heaven, looking down at his son, right? Looking down at the way they treated him looking down at the way they mocked him and made fun of him, looking at the way they insulted him, that the people walked by as he's hung on the cross and said, see, we told you you were nothing. See, we told you you weren't really the Messiah. Because if you were really the Messiah, you'd come down off that cross. If you are really the Son of God, you could call God and he would rescue you. You're not really who you are, taunting Jesus. God in heaven had to watch this take place. I can't imagine the restraint that it had to take for God to not just, I mean, just destroy everybody, right? To go down and wipe all those people out. To let Jesus just come off that cross and just wreak havoc that day on those people. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. I think that verse has new meaning when we think about it that way. For God so loved the world that he allowed his son to suffer. For God so loved the world that he sat in glory and watched his son be torn apart. For God so loved the world that Jesus willingly suffered for us. For God so loved the world that for God so loved the world that God in heaven was willing in approving that Jesus would suffer. The Bible says in Isaiah's gospel that it was the Lord's will to cause him to suffer and it was the Lord's will to crush him. How, how tragic that is, but how loving that is that God would do that. So today in your prayers, I would just encourage you, let's thank, let's thank God for his immense love and the incredible sacrifice of Jesus. Let's pray about that. God, thank you. <clears throat> that you would come into this world as a little baby born with one purpose. The whole story of Bethlehem, we recognize God, was so that in about 30 years you could end up on a cross about a couple miles away. That God, you would send your son Jesus to suffer and bleed and die, to experience a horrible pain so that you and I, so that all of us, Father, could have life. Father, you sat in heaven 
while your son was tortured and brutally beaten, and you did not spare him because you loved us. It's hard for us to fathom that, Father, but we stand today thankful for that. Lord, I pray that we would live a life in response to that that would honor you and glorify you and make you proud. God, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your son. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. Hope you have a good afternoon today. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back tomorrow morning. We're going to look at the spiritual side of the cross, what Jesus did in that moment, not just physically for us, but we'll look at that tomorrow and uh, be amazed at how good God is. So let's uh, have a good day today. We'll see you tomorrow, 9 a.m. God bless. Thank <laughs> you.